Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey and rediscover some of the earliest crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. So I have a paper pad. I'm actually not using it on my card. I used a piece of paper from this pad as a color inspiration. I'm going to be coloring um, the Please Deliver Ink Blot Shop and Hero Art Collaborative Stamp Set, and I'm going to be using Prismacolor pencils. There's going to be a little bit of stamping, a little bit of masking. I will not add a sentiment to this card because I will just wait to see what I need it for in the future. I anticipate it will be a teacher card. When I color with Prismacolor pencils, I try to remember to hold my pencil back as far down the barrel away from the writing end as I can. I always start or almost always start with my darkest color and then go toward my lightest color. Today I'm only using two color blends for everything. Um, I color most things at least two times. There is a little bit of masking so we have some dimension on this one layer card and I think that's all about the coloring. So let's hop into our crime. Um, our alphabetical journey today takes us to the state of West Virginia. Can you believe that we are at West Virginia? Now, West Virginia was admitted to the Union on June 20th, 1863. You know, Civil War time. It was a key border during the, the Civil War, and it was the only state to form by separating itself from another state, the other one was Maine, and it was the only state um, admitted to the Union during the Civil War. The other was Nevada. Um, most of the residents of West Virginia at the time it became a state had slaves, but most of them were yeoman farmers, and the delegates provided for a gradual abolition of slavery in the new state's constitution. The state legislature then abolished slavery in the state, and at the same time, it ratified the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery nationally in 1865. Now, West Virginia was not the first choice for the state's name. West Virginia was originally going to be called Kanawha to honor a local Native American tribe. But after seceding from the Commonwealth of Virginia, officials wanted to keep Virginia in the name. West Virginia is the only state completely within the Appalachian Mountain Range, hence the nickname Mountain State. North America's largest diamond was found in Peterstown, West Virginia. The first rural free delivery mail service took place in 1896 in Charlestown, and it was offered through the post office. And it was a pilot program to determine the feasibility for rural mail delivery to the rest of the country. Harrisville is home to America's oldest dime store, Birdine's Bur Five and Dime. Sorry, that was hard. And it has been continually in operation since 1908. Cecil Underwood made history in 1956 when he became the state's youngest governor at age 34. And then again in 1996 when he became the state's oldest governor after being re-elected re at 74. West Virginia is the third most forested state. In fact, and I'm going to butcher this, Monogahalea National Forest covers nearly a million acres of land and spans across 10 counties. Contrary to its name, the New River in West Virginia is actually one of the oldest in the world and it flows south to north because it was formed before the mountains. Standing tall at 292 feet, the state capitol dome is higher than the dome at the nation's capital. West Virginia is located within a day's drive of 75% of the population of the United States. The Golden Delicious Apple originated in Clay County in 1905. The USS West Virginia was hit during the, hit during the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, and the mast from that ship is now in West at the West Virginia University campus. 
The first brick street in the world was laid in Charleston. Um, okay, here's the long name of a building. Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum it is a National Historic Landmark. It is the largest hand-cut stone masonry building in North America and second in the world to the Kremlin. Could be a huge building. The largest sycamore tree in the world was located in Webster Springs, but in 2010, it fell over. It was estimated to be over 500 years old. That Phil McDonald Bridge in Beckley is the highest trust, truss bridge in the world at 700 feet tall. West Virginia was home to the first land battle of the Civil War. And you don't have to go out of the country or very far at all if you want to see the world. West Virginia holds the record for having the most towns named after cities in other countries, including Athens, Berlin, Carroll, Calcutta, Geneva, and Shanghai. And in West Virginia, there was once a ghost who revealed her murderer's identity. Now, this is not a very obscure story. In fact, you may even have heard it before, especially if you like ghost stories. I'm here for the crime side. But today, the crime and the ghosts go hand in hand. Not too many weeks ago, I did another story where a visitor from the other side helped solve a crime as well. I would like to say that the evidence in this story has a little more meat to the bone, but it is still pre-forensics, and we're working with what they had. However, I feel like it's probably a little bit better. Okay, let's um, talk about research. Now this story is in the late 1800s or mid, yeah, late 18, mid 1800s, I guess. And, um, information about these, these individuals should have been easier to find, but because of the, um, story itself, some of that information is overshadowed and I will be totally honest up front. I'm sure it's out there. I'm sure somebody has it. If I can't find it in a day, I don't. I spend a day doing research and writing up how I want to tell the story, and then I move on because this is fun for me. I mean, you know, call me weird, but it's fun for me. All right, so let's go and get on with our story. Erasmus Stribling Shoe was born in 1861 in Mount Salam, Virginia to Jacob and Elizabeth. He was fourth of their 10 children, six boys and four girls. And there are records that indicate Erasmus changed his name to William at some point. But more relevant is the fact that he was known as Trout. Don't know how. But Trout was born before West Virginia became its own state. Records do indicate that by 1885, when he married Esteline Cutlip, he was living in what had become West Virginia. Now, Trout and Esteline, I think she went by Ellie, had one daughter in 1887 named Gertrude. Their marriage did not last terribly long because by 1888 they were separated and 1889 they were divorced. And Ellie accused Trout of being, being uh, I think her quote was, great cruelty. Um, Gerda, as her child was known, appears to have been raised by her mother's parents. Now, Trout remarried by 1894 to a woman named Lucy Ann Tritt. Unfortunately, that marriage also ended after a short time. Um, this time, Lucy died. And there is no record to show exactly how Lucy died. There's no record of any investigation. But you know people, and people like stories, and stories are rumors, and rumors are varied. And the rumors around Lucy's death ranged from her falling on the ice while she was pregnant to being hit on the head by a brick when Trout was up on their home, putting a new roof on their home. Um, there was even a story that Trout had deliberately poisoned Lucy. Now, later in his life, Trout would be plagued by these theories. But if that wasn't enough turmoil in Trout's life, in between the divorce of his worth first wife and the death of his second wife, he was arrested and put into jail for two years for stealing a horse. After his second wife died, in an attempt to redirect the course of his life, Trout moved to Greenbrier County, West Virginia. 
He found work as a blacksmith, which is a trade he learned from his father. It was a lucrative trade. And he began working in the shop of James Crickshank. Um, and attached to the shop was a house. And at this point in time, a blacksmith could find plenty of work, especially if it was good work. And Trout did make a good living. He was known for his blacksmithery. I don't know what the right word for that is. He was known for being good at it. Elva Zona Heaster, Zona as she was called, was born in 1876 in Greenbrier, West Virginia, to Jacob and Mary Jane Heaster. She was the third of their nine children and one of only two girls. And again, we are at the mercy of easy research and have very little information on her early life. Her reputation was that of being a pleasant, well-educated, um, kind young woman. However, there was also some indication or some records indicated she may have, in November of 1895, at the age of 22, had a child out of wedlock. I could not find any records of that, but again, I didn't spend days and days looking. In the next year, October of 1896, Zona and her family went into town and one of the stops was at the blacksmith shop where Zona met and became infatuated with this handsome new blacksmith, Trout Shoe. And of course, she had to make sure there was a reason to return to the blacksmith shop and let him know that, yes, she was interested in him. Now, Mama, Mary Jane, she wasn't as sold on Trout as Zona was. First of all, he was 11 years older than Zona. And he was newer to their part of West Virginia. And reportedly, Mary Jane told her daughter that this otherwise easygoing looking man was hiding something. But within just a few weeks of meeting, the two had run off, eloped, and returned to town married. I think their marriage was listed in October, so like two weeks. Now, on January 23rd of 1897, Trout was visiting a neighbor, um, the Jones family, and they had a seven-year-old boy named Andy. Andy was often hired by, the, by Trout and Zona to do odd jobs around the house. And while Trout was visiting with the family, he sent Andy back to the home by the blacksmith shop to see if Zona needed anything from the store. Well, Andy gets to the house and he finds Zona lying on the floor at the bottom of the stairs. She was all stretched out. Her feet were together, her hands, one was on her belly, one was on her side, and her eyes were open. And even Andy knew that she was dead. And because he's seven, not surprisingly, he runs home and tells his mama. Well, his mama tells Trout and they send for the doctor and the coroner. And it took him nearly an hour to, re to get to the shoe home. So the doctor and coroner was um, Dr. George Knapp. And by the time he arrived at the shoe home, Trout had carried his wife's body upstairs. He had laid her out on a bed. And contrary to local custom, he had dressed her himself. And he put on her the same high-necked dress she wore to their wedding just a few months before and put a veil over her face. Typically, the women of the community would wash and dress a, a dead person before their wake and their funeral. So this was really outside the norm. Well, Dr. Knapp was trying to examine and trying to determine um, Zona's cause of death, but she's fully dressed in her burial clothes and Trout is standing right there and he's cradling her head and he's sobbing. And, and because he's so obviously full of grief, Dr. Knapp is like trying to make this quick, right? He's like, okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, you know, no stab wounds, no, no gunshots, whatever, right? He did notice in his report, he stated he did notice there was some bruising on her neck, but when he tried to take a closer look, Trout flipped his lid. So Dr. Knapp just said, okay, fine. Um, he ended the exam. He left and he listed her cause of death as quote, everlasting faint and then childbirth. Now, Zona had told nobody that she thought she was pregnant, and two weeks before she died, Dr. Knapp himself had treated her for, quote, female trouble. I don't know what they meant by that. It could have meant a lot of things. 
but okay, whatever. Now, word of Zona's death quickly spread through the community, and by late afternoon, two young men who were friends of Zona's were volunteering to ride out to an area called Meadow Bluff to tell Zona's family what had happened. The doctor sent them, not Trout. The doctor sent these young men out to the Hesters or Heasters who lived about 15 miles out of town in a small little community by the Little Sewell Mountain to tell them that their daughter was dead. Reportedly, when Mary Jane heard about it, her face grew dark and she said, quote, the devil has killed her. I don't think she meant like the devil devil. Just, you know, hang in there with me. Now on Saturday 24th, Jonah's, sorry, Jonah, Zona's body was taken by carriage to her parents' home. And a couple of weird things were going on here. There were a handful of neighbors that presided over the funeral entourage and Trout was with them, obviously. Um, they had the casket in the back of the wagon open. And Trout was showing extreme devotion toward his wife's body. He kept vigil at the head of the coffin. And even as the wagon bumped over the, the road, I'm guessing that they had the coffin open so that neighbors could pay their respects as they drove by. I don't know. I just think it's weird. Anyway, um, Zona was, her body was put up at her parents' home for a week. And they, she stayed there all of Sunday. Um, the neighbors got to come in and say their, pay their respects and say their goodbyes. Friends got to come in and a few ladies even stayed there and sat vigil with Zona's body through the night until it was time for her burial on Monday. There was some kind of things that people saw that they thought was weird. People who came to pay their respects pointed out that Trout was behaving bizarrely. He was either overwhelmingly sad with his grief or pinging like just it was described as immense energy he, he also wouldn't allow anybody to get too close to the coffin he had put a pillow on one side of her head and a rolled up cloth on the other and he told people that those items were to help zona rest easier also he had tied a large scarf around her neck and explained that you know, with tears in his eyes, that it had been her favorite. Now, okay, it's January, but okay. When it came time to move Zona to the cemetery for burial, several people noticed what seemed to be a strange looseness to Zona's head, like it flopped around. Needless to say, people are people, and the talk and the speculation began about how Zona had really met such an early death. The one person who did not speculate and did not feel the need to speculate was Mary Jane. She was convinced that Trout had something to do with Zona's death. She had liked the man from the start and had never wanted her daughter to marry him, and she was sure that he had murdered her. But she couldn't prove it. She had no evidence. She just had this this mama gut thing going on. After the wake, Mary Jane took the sheet that was inside the coffin and tried to give it back to Trout, but he didn't want it. He refused it. So she went to fold it back up and put it away, and she noticed that it smelled weird. So she went and washed it out. And according to Mary Jane, what happened next was an omen. Okay. This is the part that isn't my thing, but it's part of the story. According to Mary Jane, when she put the sheet into the wash basin, the water inside turned red. Then the sheet turned pink and the color in the water disappeared. Mary Jane claimed that she then boiled the sheet and hung it outside for several days, but the pink would not come out of the white fabric. She interpreted the eerie, quote, blood stains as a sign that Zona had been murdered. Now, Mary Jane claimed that this weird ca event caused her, um, well, her mama radar was going off, and she says that she prayed every day to know what happened to her daughter. 
and she claimed that four nights in a row, the spirit of her daughter Zona appeared to her and told her that Trout had actually killed her. Mary Jane said that Zona told her that Trout had been abusive and cruel, that he had attacked her in a fit of rage because he thought she had not cooked any meat for supper. He had savagely broken her neck, and to prove it, the ghost turned its head completely around until it was facing backwards. Okay, not a ghost story person, but I do believe in Mama Gut. Now, of course, this, um, okay, um, ghost stories and visits and stuff, this is normal in the 1800s. People claimed to have seen spirits all the time. I'm not here to debate that. I'm just saying this was not unusual for the time the story occurred. So, of course, after four days, Mary Jane goes into town to find the prosecutor, a man named John Alfred Preston, and tried to convince him to reopen the investigation into Zona's death. Um, she claimed that the visitation from her daughter was evidence that a miscarriage of justice was taking place. Now, after speaking for several hours, Mr. Preston was very polite. He was very sympathetic. And at the end of their conversation, he agreed to send deputies to speak to the doctor and others had been involved in the case. And then because people are people, local newspapers began to report that Mary Jane was not the only one in the community who was suspicious about Zona's death. There were also other citizens who started to ask questions as well as the growing you know, rumors in the community. One source even said that there were other people who claimed that Zona had come to visit them as well. Now, Mr. Preston himself went to see Dr. Knapp and the phys physician admitted that his examination of Zona had been cursory and incomplete because of her husband's grief. The two of them agreed that an autopsy was needed in order to answer questions about Zona's death once and for all. So a few days later, an ex exhumation was ordered and an inquest jury was assembled. It was reported in the local newspaper that Trout, quote, vigorously complained about the exhumation, but it was made clear to him that he would be forced to attend the inquest or he could come willingly. He replied, quote, they will not be able to prove I did it, end quote. And that's kind of a weird thing for somebody to say if they think you're, if you're claiming innocence, right? I think if you're innocent, this is going on, you're going to say, well, go ahead, fine, I'll be there, but I didn't do nothing. You know, not, you can't prove I did it. Anyway, the autopsy went on for three hours. It, uh, it was taking place inside a school next to the cemetery, so the children where school was canceled before the exhumation took place and the children were um, not brought back into the school till after the autopsy and the um, grand jury, uh, the, um, not the grand jury, the, um, what's the right word? Inquest, huh, inquest. The children stayed out of school until those things had finished up. It did take like three hours using keros the light from kerosene lanterns to, to complete the autopsy. And the body of Zona was in near perfect state because it had, was so cold in February. So there hadn't been much breakdown. Okay. Now a jury of five men had been assembled to watch the proceedings and they were standing there in this cold building along with the court officers, Trout, Andy, the seven-year-old boy who had found Zona, and other witnesses and spectators. People showed up to watch this. No, thank you. I'll wait for the report. I don't need to see it go down. Okay, so this next part is a little icky, so if you don't like icky, plug your ears for like 30 seconds. The autopsy was carried out by standard methods, which meant that the examination of vital organs, or the examination, rather, of vital organs came first. After that, doctors would normally cut an incision along the back of the skull so the brain could be removed. But this step could not be taken in the case of Zona because, as the doctors quickly found, um, her neck was broken. One of the doctors turned to Trout and said, quote, we have found your wife's neck to have been broken. Trout um, reportedly dropped, you know, 
put his chest to his her chin to his chest and and then whispered they cannot prove that i did it again he said it again the autopsy filings were quite incriminating a report on March 9th stated, quote, the discovery was made that the neck was broken and the windpipe mashed. On the throat were marks of fingers indicating that she had been choken. The neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae. The ligaments were torn and ruptured. The windpipe had been crushed at a point in front of her neck, end quote. So the findings were made public at once and the community was, um, well, they were upset, to say the least. Trout was arrested and charged with murder, and he was locked up in a small stone jail on Washington Street in Lewisburg. And in spite of the fact that evidence against him was circumstantial, he was indicted by a grand jury and was formally arraigned for murder, and he immediately entered a plea of not guilty. He still, I didn't do it, didn't do it. Now, while Trout was in jail awaiting for the beginning of his trial, information about his past was beginning to surface. This is when the area residents found out about his first wife divorcing him after he abandoned her and their child. Then they discovered that his relocation to Greenbrier after the death of his second wife, just eight months into their marriage, was quick and that he had left before any action in regard to his wife could be taken. Um, the, the, the theory was that the brick that fell off the roof and killed Lucy was not accidental. While he was in jail, Trout remained in good spirits and he reported that his grieving period for Zona had come to an end. In fact, he announced that he had a lifelong goal of having seven wives. And since Zona had only been his third and he was still a young man, he had a good chance of attaining that goal. He also repeatedly told reporters that he is, his guilt in the matter couldn't be proved. <sighs> I'm not liking Trout so much now. Felt bad for him at first. I'm not liking him so much now. Trout's trial began on June 22, 1897, and a number of people from the community testified against him. The highlight of the trial, of course, was the appearance of Mary Jane. Mr. Preston, the prosecutor, put her on the stand as both the mother of the dead woman and the first person to notice the unusual, unusual circumstances of Zona's death. A Mr. Preston wanted to make sure that she appeared sane and reliable. He did not mention anything about the ghostly visits from Zona. It was bound to make her appear irrational and because it was inadmissible. Because, okay, in order to introduce the testimony of the ghost of Zona, it would have to be cross-examined. Otherwise, it's hearsay. That was his justification. Not because it's weird that a ghost gave him the evidence, but because the ghost could not be cross-examined, <laughs> could not be cross-examined by the defense. Okay. I mean, good play, good play, right? Um, and fortunately for Trout, his attorney did ask Mary Jane about her ghostly sighting. It seemed obvious that he was trying to make it look like Mary Jane was ridiculous. He wanted her um, visions classified as, you know, a mother's grief ratings. And he worked hard to get her to admit she might've been mistaken about what she saw. And he continued to badger her for quite a long time, but Mary Jane never wavered in her description of Zona's ghost, nor about what the spirit had told her about Trout's guilt. When the defense counsel realized the testimony was not going the way he wanted, he, you know, no further questions, you know, go sit down. But by that time, the damage was done. Um, the defense and not the prosecution had introduced a testimony about the ghost. The judge had a hard time telling the jury to exclude it. And it was apparent that most people in the community believed Mary Jane had seen her daughter's ghost. And it didn't matter what Trout said, his own testimony in his own defense 
held less um, validity, was less valid than Mary Jane's ghostly visit from her dead daughter. Now, the jury was sent to deliberate, and they deliberated about 70 minutes and quickly found Trout guilty. In fact, 10 of the 12 jurors voted that he be hanged. But because that vote was not unanimous, Trout was sentenced to life in prison. Now, the sentence did not go, it, well, it did not satisfy everybody in Greenbrier County. And on July 11th of the same year, a citizens group of you know, somewhere around 30 men assembled about eight miles west and formed a lynching party. They had purchased a brand new rope <laughs> and were well armed and they started toward the jail. There was a man named George Hera who alerted the sheriff and had it not been for George, Trout surely would have been lynched. In fact, it was said that Trout was, when he was told about this mob coming toward him, he was so agitated he could not tie his own shoes. The sheriff took Trout into the woods about a mile from town and hid him there until the deputies were able to disband the mob and return them to their homes. A few people were indicted on lynching, but they were not convicted due to lack of evidence. Um, after this, Trout was moved to the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville, and he lived there for three years. He died on March 13, 1900, from one of the um, illness epidemics that swept through the prison that spring. And at that time, the prison buried their unclaimed um, bodies near um, or in um, Tom's Run Cemetery, which was near the, the prison. But they didn't keep records on who was buried where for like another 30 years. So there's not really any good idea of where Trout's shoe was actually buried. Now, Mary Jane lived to tell her tale, and she told it to anyone who would listen. She died um, in September of 1916 without ever recanting her story about her daughter's ghost. The details never changed. As for Zona, her ghost was never seen again. But there is a historical marker along Route 60 in Greenbrier County that reads, Interred in nearby cemetery is Zona Heaster Shoe. Her death in 1897 was presumed natural until her spirit appeared to her mother to describe how she was killed by her husband, Edward, a.k.a. Trout. Autopsy on the exhumed body verified the apparition's account. Edward, found guilty of murder, was sentenced to the state prison. Only known case in which testimony from a ghost helped convict a murderer. Okay, in my true crime heart, I think Trout is guilty. I think that for the eight, late 1800s, the autopsy evidence and the accidental, air quotes here, discovery of his wife's body by a seven-year-old and the way that he was behaving is enough evidence for the time to convict him. Would it fly now? Oh, heavens no. We would absolutely want to have more evidence. I also 100% believe in mama gut. I believe I am a mama and I believe that sometimes you just know something isn't right. And mama, Mary Jane, she knew something was not right about that man. And she did not want him marrying her daughter. Tell me what you think. Do you feel like this was a rightful conviction? Tell me how you feel about the ghost story part if you want. I have photographs. Well, kind of, sort of. This is a painting of Zona in her wedding slash burial dress. And this is a duriotype of them. Um, it's theorized that this is their wedding day because she's wearing the same dress. This is a picture of their home. And this comes from the County Historical Society. I also have a picture of the Greenbrier ghost plaque on Route 60 in West Virginia. I hope you enjoyed this story today. I have a couple other videos here that you might like. I also have that subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below. Give me a thumbs up, tell YouTube you liked it, 
and I hope you have a really, really fabulous day.